Our lectionary reading for today is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, verse 26 to 39. One of the, one of the famous stories about Jesus. Then they arrive at the country of Gerasenes, which is opposite of Galilee. As he stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, what have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked, Jesus then asked him, "What is your name?" He said, "Legion," for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now, there on the hillside, a large herd of swine feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herd saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then the people came out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, with Jesus. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. Sisters and brothers, siblings in Christ, the gospel for our salvation. So this is one of the more famous stories about Jesus. And it is, it is a synoptic story, meaning that it is found in all three Gospels of Mark, Matthew, and Luke. And we read the version of Luke. Although, siyempre, as you know about the Gospels, mayroong konting difference sa bawat version. Particularly, the major difference is that in the Gospel of Matthew, the story of this exorcism, um, doon sa Gospel of Matthew, ang version niya, dalawa yung possessed. There were two possessed uh, uh, man, men. But in the Gospel of Mark and in the Gospel of Luke, there is only one. Okay? And then in, in, in Matthew, he, Matthew never named, never mentioned the name of the, uh, of the demon or slash demons. Okay? While it may have happened, we don't fully know if it really did. We must not get stuck with the factuality or certainty of an actual event. So it is not important for us whether it happened, it did not happen, because if we get stuck with the factuality of the event, 
the story is dead. What is important is how is this story, whether it really did happen or maybe it happened, but how did it really happen? What, the important is how is this relevant to us today, 2,000 years after? 2,000 plus minus years after it was written in the Gospels. How is this relevant to us? Because again, many of the books of the Bible, as we said earlier, was not written intended for us. So we are just uh, borrowing these stories and, and, and interpreting them in such a way that how are these relevant to us today? So demonic possessions. Do you believe in demonic possessions? Do you believe in it? I've wa- <laughs> Do you believe in an actual demonic or spirit possession? Or yung, ano may napapadod natin kay Inday Badiday dati na uh, possessed by the Santo Nino? Ako, ang Santo Nino! <laughs> Ganun, di ba? Magandang gabi ba yan? So, how... Do you believe? Um, yeah, I... I loosely believe in it because I know for a fact that some congregations of the priests really do uh, learn how to exercise. Yeah. yeah. There's, in the Vatican, in the last 20 years, they have revisited uh, the, the possession phenomenon and they have started to, in the last 20, 30 decades, they've started to train priests to be exorcists. And there's uh, there's an official exorcist in every diocese now. Uh, depending kung gano'ng kalaki yung diocese, there will be uh, one or several exorcists in, in the Catholic diocese. Now, I... Well, based on what I studied in seminary, we, we I'm from a Protestant seminary, we were not taught to do exorcism, okay? <laughs> okay, it's not in our... Uh, Curriculum. Um, but as far as what I, I also studied about it, it's rare. It, it, a, a, a true and actual demonic possession is very, very rare. Very, very rare. It, it doesn't, it's not a normal occurrence. And in the Catholic uh, practice nowadays, they would have someone who claims to be possessed or a relative saying that his child or, or whoever saying that possessed, they would do a battery of psychological psychiatric tests before really accepting or believing that the person is, is possessed in some way. Um, so it Actually, the, the job of the exorcist doesn't really happen all the time. Okay? And the one that we have watched in uh, Exorcist 1, 2, and 3, it doesn't also happen in that, uh, in that uh, what do you call this, very Hollywood elaborate way. Okay? Um, even that kind of, of possession is almost, almost uh, unheard of. Okay, the, way, the how it's presented in in Hollywood, um, and there's this. I, I've been watching the series. There's an, a series, The Exorcist. Uh, it has two seasons. Seasons. Um, it got cut off because it did not really had a following. But I found it very, uh, for me, <laughs> very interesting. So I I, I watched it. Uh, so it, it's rare. It's a, a rare thing. Um, and this particular story of the Jesus as an exorcist, well, there is a historical reason for that. Okay? Especially when the writer of Luke and Mark, well, of course, Mark is the earliest gospel when they maintained and named the name of the demon, which is Legion. So they are actually trying to... Uh, there are accounts of 
there are there are oral accounts of the Jesus exorcism. Jesus as an exorcist, Jesus as a healer. But the writers of the gospel crafted it in such a way that they have a particular intention for it. And one clue is why they named the name the demon as such. Um what was the name of the demon or demons? Legion. legion. What is a legion? What do you call a unit of the army today? A battalion. So a legion, they don't call it battalion back then, they call it a legion. The first legion of Rome, the sixth legion of Rome. It's, it's a unit of the army, usually a minimum of 5,000 legionnaires. So they call the soldiers as legionnaires. A minimum is 5,000. Okay, 5,000. A uh, unit, a unit of the army. So you, just by the name, you can, you can have a whole lot of meaning and have an idea why, what this most likely meant to look and to the author of Matthew, uh, author of Mark. And also gives you a clue why Matthew left it off. <laughs> left off that, that name. But that is a preaching for, or a Bible study for another time. I will approach this story today as a metaphorical narrative. As a, a story of how it should be relevant to us today. Um... And it's, it's a little bit close to the LGBT experience because conservative Christians have always, some of them have always deemed us as possessed by the spirit of homosexuality. Okay, And I personally experienced, I didn't know, my mom allowed me to go to my aunt who is an evangelical Protestant and we went to Cubao when was this? High school, some many, many years ago, young as I was. I didn't know what that, we, we, we were where or what we are doing, but we, I attended her church. They had me sit, and suddenly someone came to me, told me, close your eyes, raise your hands, let's pray for the Holy Spirit. That's why I didn't still know what it was. Okay, let's pray. And after the prayer and after the singing of Come Holy Spirit, suddenly uh, two or three of them uh, pray. Oh, I knew I knew what they were doing because before the ritual, they had me check the list of what are your sins? Masturbation, homosexuality, uh, what else? Alcoholism, pornography. So they will check. So that when they start Spirit of masturbation, I, I, I expel you. Come out. <laughs> and I was thinking, when, when the ritual was already happening, I was thinking, should I dramatize? Should I act it out? <laughs> just, just to, you know, just to play with them. To play along. So yeah, I had that experience. So they, they, in a way, this and 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 this story is also used uh, against LGBT in a way sometimes. Now I would say also, in terms of possession, because one of the things that I was taught in seminary is that we are all possessed, not necessarily an actual demonic spirit. But what are the things that actually have possessed us? Possessed our lives? What holds us in bondage? And for LGBT, we have been told over and over again, aside from that one that we are possessed by that spirit of homosexuality, we are told of so many things about us without them really knowing what, what it is about. We are told, we are conditioned to believe that uh, 
who we are or what we are feeling is sin. Or it is an abnormality that can be cured. Or both together. And that you can be cured by praying, exorcism, and conversion therapy. We are told that. And we have sisters and brothers who have had the unfortunate experience of actually going through all three terrible things. We are told repeatedly, we are told who we are. We are told that what we are feeling is wrong. We are told that it's not just about LGBT, but generally anything sexual is, any sexual feeling is a temptation of the devil. Anything sexual is a temptation of the devil, and if you should practice it, it is an expression of the devil's power in your life. We are told that. And for us LGBT, it's double jeopardy. Because you are not just sexual, you are a homosexual. You are not only committing a general sin of, of, of lust and sex, you are committing, and, and some, I, I've heard this somewhere, some preachers would say, the most terrible sin in the Bible. How did you come to that conclusion? You know, and, and so when I was I was a young boy discovering not just my sexuality, but sexuality in general. Um, and this is something that we are we have. I don't know if you haven't for gay men. Uh, or men in general, so I uh, excuse me to our ladies here and to those who are, will be watching. Um, so when I was growing up and discovering sexuality in general and my homosexual uh, desires, of course, you will, sometimes you would take a selfie. Uh, because I was in an all boys school. So sometimes after school, what? When I was in uh, grade six or seven, no, grade five, as early as grade five. And you, after, upon coming home, you lock yourself in your room and you take a, you do a selfie. <laughs> and at that point, because it's a Catholic school, so I know what the, the, the Catholic Church is teaching. So each time that I would do that, at the peak of that, I would exclaim, Lord, have mercy. Those are my words. Lord, have mercy. And I will say it two to three times. Because it's again double whammy. You're not just committing a sin of selfie, but you're the one that you're desiring about is your classmate that is sitting across you in the room. Or your classmate in your swimming class, you know, you were looking at. And we are told, we are, this, this, this general uh, prohibition of sex and lust and of homosexuality is ingrained we become possessed with it. A negative attitude toward sex and homosexuality. We are told that this is an abnormal feeling at a young age. And sometimes the ones who will tell this to us are the persons who brought us out into this world our very parents, our siblings. 
we are told that gender identity, trans women and trans men and gender non-binary are ideologies of gender that comes from the devil. The Vatican actually says that. The va some bishops would say the pride march is a, is a threat to children. Do not attend a pride march and don't bring your children there. You, you will infect them with the gay disease. At some point in the U.S., in the Western countries, in television, you can find this in YouTube, they will advertise or show programs where the preacher or even the police the, the, or the mayor would say, um, homosexual are, homosexuals are corruptors of children, corruptors of your young, of our young. There's this particular clip in, in YouTube where, I don't know, it is it's a government official or a school, I, I think a, a principal in the public school. And there was this, in the gymnasium, a group of, I mean, all the students, and he was saying, do not even think of trying to practice any form of homosexuality because we will catch you. We will know you. And you, and once that is known, you will live a terrible life. We will make sure of that. So this is something that we are told. These things becomes part of our consciousness. And some of us, in the, especially in the Philippine context, some of us, we are deeply religious people. 80% are Roman Catholic. We are torn between our love for God and our churches and what the churches and our leaders tells us. We are torn. We are confused. And most of the time, we try our best because that's what we believe also. We try our best to pray the gay away, to pray the transgender away. If you just pray hard enough, it will go away. The problem is, it is not going away. It's even becoming more and more powerful as you try to suppress it. As you try to pray over it. And, and some of us, uh, depend, eh? it depends. There, are, there is also a spectrum of experience. But what is known is in a more evangelical Protestant churches versus Roman Catholic uh, churches and families, in the Philippines, you will have a more terrible experience growing up as an LGBT uh, in the evangelical Protestant churches. And we certainly met some of those when they came to church. I will tell you one of their stories. I won't say his name. He is a son of a pastor. And, when, and he loved the church. The church of his father, he, he served in the church in, in various capacities. Um, he, he loved the church. He loved the, the friends that he grew up with in church, in Sunday school and, and all that. But later on, I don't know how, but his parents found out that he was gay. And because the father is the pastor, he was removed from all the ministries that he was serving in and his father told him that you uh, you can no longer serve in the church because you are living in a state of sin and you are a rebellious child against God and against me your parent me your father and he was not disowned he was not uh, sent out of their home but he, uh, talking to me and to the other leaders of the church during that time, he expressed how, if, how hell-like his life in the church. There was not a day that his father did not make him feel that indeed he was unclean. 
or that he was rebellious or that he was um, he was an abomination in the view of his father and the church. And again, like that 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 uh, that guy, that young guy, some of us have experienced one way or another that kind of uh, experience, and that we believed it. We also believe it. We also believe it. Perhaps indeed I am abnormal. Perhaps indeed I have a choice on this matter. Perhaps indeed I am just possessed by some homosexual demon. And then some of us, some that you know in the LGBT community would uh, go about in self-destruction. Uh, not everyone, but we know of stories where some LGBT would go into drug addiction, into sexual addiction, and in many other things. And finally, when the and also when the person gets infected with HIV, that gets known to the family, that gets known to the to the church. Then it's a validation. That indeed, being a homosexual is indeed a sin. That is the evidence. Because you continued with your LGBT life. This is what your life became. And, 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 and churches and pastors will grind that, that kind of rhetoric. They love that kind of story. You know, that's why you lived a kind of life. Not realizing that that happened, those things that we internalize as self-hatred, self-loathing, shame, lack of confidence, hatred, anger, was caused by them. Caused by the repeated theology and ideology that you as a human being, generally, your sexuality, not even just homosexuality, and then the double thing about homosexuality, repeatedly to you, was caused by them. Was caused by them was caused by growing up in a church, in a culture where you are deemed unworthy, unlovable. And you internalize that. We internalize that. I'm not worthy of love. I'm not worthy of respect. I am not worthy of marriage of recognition. You cannot be gay and Christian. You know, one of our experiences also, uh, Chris, so we, we have, you, some of you know, we have, and some of you are here because of that, we have an official app in Grindr, in Blood, in, uh, and my, my greatest surprise was an app for women, uh, her. Uh, and that some, there was a, a couple of people who message us saying, uh, gay men saying that what they, they were scandalized that there is a church inviting people to church in a pro-LGBT church. And they were calling us, you're, you're, you're the, the hell spawn. <laughs> you're an agent of the devil, something like that. These are gay men. And if you read on the comment section of anything that is LGBT or, or same-sex marriage, you will see there, I, I'm gay, but I don't support same-sex marriage. That's already way over the top. We should, not, we should no longer, because we already know that we are sinning, we will double sin by having marriage. That's an example of internalized. Uh, self-hatred, shame, and all that, all that 
kind of theology. It is legion. It is legion. Everything that we have ever post came into us is a legion of many bad things and we have internalized them. We are something to be feared and therefore we are then rejected by the churches. We are disowned by our parents called rebellious. But, one way or another, we find Jesus. Or at, le or at least what Jesus stood for. We find either MCC or another progressive church. Or we find chosen family and friends who accept us, who celebrate us, who are like us, our queer tribe. We find a semblance of Jesus, whether in MCC as a church or somewhere else. And we, in finding those communities or group of friends, we find healing in the acceptance. We find healing in the encounter. In the encounter, oh, there is an LGBT affirming church. At first, you cannot believe it yourself. But you will muster the courage to go to 401, the Oro building. And suddenly, the encounter changes you. As so many others have done, Mindanao Avenue, Yellow Room Cubao, NCCP, and now here. Or again, not necessarily with MCC, you know? Who are those friends of yours? Because no, not many people find us, but they find friends and, fam and fr friends and chosen families who celebrate them. How did they start to heal you? from the toxic message of religion. We find Jesus and therefore they fear us all the more. Because again, you cannot be gay, you cannot be transgender, you cannot be lesbian and Christian at the same time. Therefore, conservative Christians all the more become crazy. You know, they could... They cannot get, you know, like what Paul, you know, when Paul heard about the man taking the father's wife. It goes, they suddenly get crazy. It cannot happen. It must not happen. And LGBT themselves, you're a practicing, believing Christian and you are in grinder. How is that possible? And they're... There we find the greater fear. Then they fear us all the more. Like the society, like the city of Gerasenes. Finding that the possessed man was healed, was in his right mind. Healed by Jesus. Freed by Jesus. They could not believe that this was possible. And that they feared Jesus and the, the formerly possessed man all the more. And that's why one of the greatest dangers to the conservative Christians is the progressive queer Christian. That they fear the most because we are set free. Their legion that have possessed us is no longer with us, has no longer power over us, and we can be face to face with them in Pride March or elsewhere and say, God loves everyone. We can stand face to face with them already, for they have no power anymore over us. Their legion is gone from us because we found 
the true message of Jesus. And after being set free, ano yun sa story? This particular story? Jesus told the formerly possessed man, Go home. He sends him away. Go home. Tell the wonderful work of God, what God has done in your life. Go and proclaim that. Go home. Tell your story. Tell the story of God in your life. Tell your coming out story so that others may know, so that others may be set free. And I tell you, likewise, as Jesus did, as Jesus did, after this worship, whether you will attend Pride next Saturday or wherever you are, you are healed, you are set free. Go home, tell your story. In the name of the one who set us free. Amen.